Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. Special welcome to any first-time guests. We're grateful to have you here worshiping our God together. And there's nothing like joining with the saints to lift your mind and your hearts to just sing about God and forget yourself. And uh, nothing more beautiful than a man who had to say goodbye to his wife this week suddenly to come in here and worship with us. So to God be the glory, brother. We love you, Bob. Mm. Just let's thank God for his grace. Come here. Come give Pastor Murphy a hug, brother. I love you. That's a special brother who stood out here for I don't know how many years, just greeting every one of you as you come in with the joy of Jesus Christ week in and week out. 14? Wow. So let's be the body of Christ and help this brother journey these, this season. We, Dan Burke was in a very serious accident on his bike, and he's healing. They're doing surgeries, and lungs collapsed, and he and his wife, Rachel, have just been worshiping God in the midst of it. And then uh, her brother Nathan Dix was carrying a mirror and it cracked and cut arteries and just a blessing. His arm is still attached and just worshiping God in the middle of it. And there's going to be a journey for these two as they heal. And so let's continue to help them and love them and journey together. So I would just like to pray for these, these ones. Father, we come before you and I Thank you for Bob Schultz, for the faith that you put within him, a faith that when it's tried and tested, what comes forth is Jesus Christ. To you be the glory. God, give him grace and strength. Be with him. Help him. Bless him. Encourage him. Let him weep deeply and let him sing strongly. God, be with our dear brother during this season, we pray. Thank you for the life of Sherry who continued preaching Jesus Christ till her last breath to anyone who came in. God, we thank you for the the giddiness that she had saying, I just want to be with Jesus, and now she has that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you preserved Dan's life in that accident, and you are healing him up. We ask that you would continue to just be with him and his wife during this time, and I thank you for Nathan and his sweet wife and family, and Lord, as he will journey much therapy in, in hoping to restore uh, the damage in that hand. So God, please be with the Dix family. Um, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, guys, as a, a church, we're studying through the epistle of Romans. If you'll turn to Romans chapter 14, if you're visiting, you've missed a lot. You've missed a lot. <clears throat> and I would try to review it. The church knows I would, but I'm not going to do that this morning. So maybe we'll start Romans over again in a Bible study if you'd like to go through it. Uh, We're looking at at how in Romans 12, 1 and 2, of how to know the will of God. You're, you're, You're saved. You're right before God. You've been cleansed and forgiven. You stand not guilty in His presence. And now we're learning how to renew our minds to think God's thoughts about how do we live for God? How do we please Him? How do we offer up our bodies a living sacrifice to this God. And so we're just refining our thinking and renewing our minds to to be pleasing offerings to this God who gave us mercy in Jesus Christ. We've seen the fulfillment of the whole law in Romans 13, 8 through 10, is to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus took it deeper and said, you're you're to love as, as I have loved you. The highest level, the highest measurement there has ever been. A height, depth, breadth, and length that no man can fathom. And we are just um, external rule followers. I've never seen anything more. We love, give me rules, give me my external things. Forget the heart. I just want rules. And that's been the history of the church. There's so much of that that has broken in to our churches. We love just give me what to do, not how to be. Love in Romans 5, 5, Paul said, was shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And it's produced something that could never have been produced before. We we were lovers of self. We were in bondage to self. And what's bubbled up through the cross and work of Jesus Christ is an undying love for him and an undying love for others uh, with a sincere heart. And we are learning how it's manifested now in the Christian life. 
upon the exhortation in Romans 13. Do you know what time it is? Wake up. We're in the end days. Get, get, get serious. Quit playing around in the things that were, were evidences that you were an unbeliever and lost. And, and now give yourself to put on the Lord Jesus Christ in these days and make no provision for the flesh. How do we deal now in Romans 14 with Christian liberty? We're moving in, we're looking at our, our freedoms, these areas that, that they're not clear commandments, but they're, they're, all, they're all moral. Uh, how do we deal with these? Um, Paul's saying can become sinful really quick. They're, they're, they're small, but they're, they're big in how they can affect us and affect the body of Christ. <laughs> so Paul is instructing us how to dwell together in unity and love with differences on these kind of issues. And we don't like differences. We we like everybody to think the same and look the same and act the same. And it's very hard for us when we have differences and God's showing us how do we act? How do we love one another in, in the way he designed this whole program and kingdom of God? So let me just read our section for you this morning where we left off. Romans 14, verse 10. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? If that sounds familiar, it should. That was exactly what he said in verse 3. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Let's pray over these words this morning. These are hard words, what we're going to look at, and, and we're going on a razor's edge where you can fall off into heresy on either side. So I need you to wake up. Let's let the Word of God speak to us, not what we want, what we think or hope. This is God's Word, and, and it's, it's sobering this morning, and uh, Americans need sober. Uh, we're very giddy. And, and this morning, this, there's nothing giddy about what Paul's going to teach us. So let, let's go before our God and ask him to minister to our hearts deeply through his word. Father, I come before you, and what we want is holy lives. We want to offer up our bodies in a way that's pleasing. And in this area, Lord, there's a lot of confusion. There's been a lot of hurt. There's been a lot of damage throughout the history of the church. And God, with the law of Christ written in our hearts, we want to love our brethren. We don't want to hurt them. We don't want to stumble and destroy their faith. God, I pray, teach us. Teach us how to be pleasing to you in these areas of what we approve and disapprove and teach us how to love our brethren in these differences. Lord, this is big. Paul spends so much time on this. Help us. Help us to learn. Teach us. Do mighty things in the hearts of your children this morning, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our outline, we began looking in verse 1 with a general principle to accept the one who's weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. And so we saw the first thing is Paul never tells us this weaker or stronger brother, which one's right or wrong. He, he just exhorts us. What, I, what I'm most concerned about is that you receive one another into fellowship, into bond, and, and into love. That's his greatest concern as we begin looking at this. And then he pulls out his first example that one has faith that he can eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. And I, I've been preaching that for years. If you're a vegetarian, you're going to get weak. You're gonna get, it's going to be hard. That's, that was cheap. That was low-hanging fruit. Is they're, they're struggling with what's kosher, what's been maybe offered to idols and then sold in the marketplace. And so these were real issues that were causing conflict in the church. And Paul's coming and saying that you have both these people, and here's the third point, the charge in verse 3, then, the one who eats, don't regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted them. You, if you can't accept somebody on these issues, he's saying, God's accepted them. Are you more holy than God? Don't, don't look down and don't judge based on weaker, stronger how you look at this. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master, he stands or falls. And the perseverance of the saints, they will stand by the grace of God. For the Lord is able to make him stand. Some of the most encouraging words in the Bible, I will stand because God is able to make me stand. Praise be 
to the Lord. Second example then in verse 5, one person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. And so now we move into these different days of, are, are one more holy than others? We celebrate Feast of Booze and different things like that. Let, let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. So we're, we're, we're to get convictions on these things. And we've talked is how, you're trying to get unity. And Paul's saying, get convicted, get, get strong views on these things. And so it isn't just, let's all get along. You know, it's not a big deal. He says, it's a big deal. Go get convictions on these issues and, and stand and live for God and his glory on these things. So, so be fully convinced in your own mind. Do the work labor on these things. Don't just laissez-faire, I'm going to live any way I want. He, he wants us to think through, how do I be pleasing to God in these areas? Paul's not done. What jumped out at me is we're dealing, again, with these small ethical molehills. They, they seem so small, whether you eat meat or whether you drink or don't. And, and he's given these answers with these huge doctrines of the perseverance of the saints, that you're going to live or die. And, and the last time we looked at this, and uh, Logan, thank you, brother. Where'd he go? I, I saw him say, yeah, that was so beautiful on Sunday. God's, God's moving in that man and through the word of God. So thank you for that. So mountains of doctrine are going on in this chapter. And now this morning, he, he's going to make it even weightier. And then next week, I, I think he makes it even more weighty. He's going to say, you might stumble and lose your faith over these issues. And this morning, he, uh, it's so important is it causes divisions. It causes splits. It could hurt your own conscience and ruin your walk with God. It's, it's the opposite of the law of Christ if we don't love one another rightly through this. And so our testimony to the world is hurt and it gets a black eye if we don't understand these things and do them well. In verse 20, it says that you could destroy the work of God in them. Verse 23, he says that it's sin. Once you get a conviction and act against it, now we're dealing with sin. And so you're going to be judged now this morning by how you deal with people on these issues. It's, it's going to show your faith by your loving and your receiving one another on these issues. Paul's going to just say it's not small. You're going to come into judgment before God for how you deal with these things. So verse, uh, 1 Timothy 1.19, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. They didn't keep a good, clean conscience and, and they've shipwrecked their faith. And that's where Paul's going to be moving this. And so just quickly, as I'm, I'm going to finish up this section here in Romans uh, and then we're going to spend a whole week on, I'm um, going to call it a primer on the conscience. Uh, there's so many questions coming out that I, 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 we need to do a survey of the whole understanding of conscience because the conscience is, it just works on commandments. It works on uh, the government uh, established over us. We saw in Romans 13, uh, it, it, it works on the law of Christ being put within us and it works on these areas like Romans 14. And so we're going to try to understand it. And, and that Sunday, I have an elder who I think is uh, probably the most equipped I've ever met in understanding the conscience, and he's going to teach on it. And then Sunday, that Sunday night, we'll give you the exact date. We'll come back here, have a Q&A to dig into these things and talk about them and wrestle, and then a prayer time together. So just want to throw that out for you because we, we got to get our arms around conscience and how it works. So let's kind of keep journeying through this this morning but uh, I think it was John Piper, he said, how are we to love each other on non-essential issues is essential. <laughs> so they're non-essential issues, but how we treat each other is essential. And that's what Paul's trying to lead us in here. So let's keep journeying Paul's argument from where we left off the last time we were together. You're going to stand before God in judgment in verses 10 through 12. In verse 10, he, he picks up verse 3 again, don't, don't condemn and don't judge one another on these issues uh, because we're going to all stand before the judgment seat of God. Here's an argument that he's giving again for it. And so just thinking through now of motives in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Paul says, don't go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness 
and disclose the motives of men's hearts. Uh, I don't know the motive of your heart. I can look at actions and maybe get there. But Paul's saying God's going to come and he's going to disclose the, the motives of your heart and what you did. And he says, then each man's praise will come to him from God. That it's a believer. It's, it's, it's going to come from these pure motives that God has put within us. So here we are struggling with someone who has a difference on a conscience issue uh, than, than I do. They, they, they're able to, to drink wine and, and I can't. And they're able to eat meat and I eat vegetables. And so these issues that he's bringing up, we have some differences. And I, I think their way's bad. I think their way is hurtful. It's certainly not as holy as my standards. So how do I know if, if they're doing it for the right reason? I, it just looks like maybe you're not because you're not, your standard's not as holy as mine. So I don't think you're really doing it to please God. And so you're starting to go now into motives and judging and, and Paul's telling us here, one day it's going to be sorted out by the only one who can really sort it out. You're not fit for that job. God will sort it out. He's going to, he's going to sort it out. The one who, who knows all things, your motives and why you do what you do, the one who can judge it rightfully will. And so maybe don't spend so much time on your judgment of everyone else on these issues and think more about this judgment that will actually judge how you judge people on these issues. He's saying, get off the judgment seat because you're going to appear, appear before it one day. And so truly, we are not fit for judging these conscience issues this side of glory, judging others' motives and their, their conscience convictions. We, we are not wired for that. We can judge sin. In Matthew 18, he tells us clearly to judge sin and bring witnesses. And, and so the, there's, there's a, a judging of clear, observable sins. 1 Corinthians 6, we're to judge. Uh, it says there are disputes and you're going to court, brother against brother. Can't the church judge those things? Uh, motives, convictions, the, the best way though here is to let God do it. I, I just have to receive them in this passage and not make judgment. So let's say someone comes up to you and says, I'm struggling with looking at things I shouldn't be looking at on my computer. Cut your right hand off. Cut your right hand off. And the next guy comes up and says, you know, I, I just started dating and is it okay to hold hands in church? It's not, cut your right hand off. It's like, let's talk about reasons, issues, hearts, motives. So I just want you to see there's commandments and there's these conscience issues that we need to learn how to deal with it. And some of you want to say on conscience issues, cut your right hand off. And you want to treat it like a commandment of sin against it. And so we, we got to learn and grow in this. And so let's pull out just a little and look at what Paul is saying here this morning. And again, we are on a razor's edge of truth. And we can fall off on either side. And here's my concern. Either side is heresy. The church is strewn with uh, uh, times in history where they fell off on one side or the other. And so my prayer is that every one of us would walk this razor's edge because I'm going to say it's essential. That this is teaching in God's word that we must be in agreement and we must understand it together. Now, conscience issues, he's going to say there's some differences. But this issue this morning uh, is really important to Paul. And so what Paul is getting at, if you'll just look in verse 10, <coughs> it's, it's very emphatic in the Greek. But you, you yourselves, you know, that, that Greek class, you, you, I think you have interlinears sitting here this morning. Look at all the intensive pieces to this. You, why do you judge your brother? Why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Verse 12, so then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. And so that it's very clear. Paul is driving this home. He wants you to get it. Each one of you, yourself, are going to stand before God in judgment. You're going to give an account. There, uh, there's a rendering, he's saying, that's going to take place. And Paul is saying, you all have a judgment day. In Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed unto man once to die. And after this comes judgment. We are going to appear in court you have been given a summons to appear 
And we're going to appear before the judgment seat of God. And, and the milk toast that goes on in our country doesn't like to think about this or talk about this. And Paul is going to talk about it this morning. And I just want to read you some verses to show you this is all over Scripture. Ecclesiastes 3.17 Solomon says, I said to myself, God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man. For a time for every matter and every deed is there. And then in chapter 12, he says, the conclusion when all has been heard is this. Fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment. Everything which is hidden, whether good or evil, there's going to be a judgment day. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Paul says, Therefore, don't go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's heart, and then each man's praise will come from God. We just read that. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, For we must all, believers, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Earlier in this letter, Paul wrote in Romans 2.4, Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? His patience and his kindness is to cause you to repent, and you might be sitting here going, he doesn't care. I can just keep living any way I want. He doesn't care. And he says, don't you know the kindness of God and his patience is to lead you to repentance, not cockiness in your sin. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. It was going to render to every man according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance and doing good Seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, every believer. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but just obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation. There'll be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also for the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to every man who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And again, that's before the section on justification. But I want you to see Paul saying there's going to be a judgment day according to the deeds that have been done in the body. And then Revelation 20, as we close out scriptures, John says, I saw the dead, <coughs> the great and the small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened, plural. And then another book, singular, was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things that were written in the books, plural. They were judged by the, the books, plural, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, that's the second death. And if anyone's name was not found written in the singular book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. A lot of truth here. We could spend months on this. I just want quickly that we have books in the plural and then a book singular called the book of life. And we're told that the dead are judged by what was written in the books, your life, what you've done. And verse 14, they're thrown into the lake of fire if their name was not written in the book of life. That's the singular book. And that's that book that we saw in Romans 9, your election. You're being written in that before the foundation of the world. So what is this? This is big. The books of all our deeds are recorded. We are judged according to these books, John says. And if not in the book of life, if you haven't been written in the book of life, you're going to be thrown into the eternal lake that burns with fire. So get this. This means that no one, please hear this, will ever be saved on the basis of their deeds. You, you'll never be saved by what you did in those books. They're not going to be what saves you. We will all go to hell if we're judged by those books. 
No one will ever be perfect and live the life that Jesus lived. They'll never open your book and say, boy, he gets to go to heaven because of how he lived his life. So I just want you to not fall off that ledge. Don't fall off. You'll have no hope. What has been the message of Romans? Pastor, you spent four years, four years grounding me in the gospel. I got justification by faith in Christ alone. You've looked at it from every angle and you won't be quiet about it. Yes, and it's true. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Nothing will ever separate you from his love, believer. The law, no one could climb up it. No one could ever be justified by their books. You need to die to your books getting you justified. You, this morning, if you're still climbing that ladder, you need to die to thinking you can ever be good enough to get into the presence of God. It's perfection. You will not be able to climb that ladder into his presence. There is none righteous, not even one. Your works are irrelevant if your name isn't written in the book of life. Romans 9 through 11, chosen by God, your name is recorded. And God says, I'll lose none of them. I will lose none of them. Jesus says, no one will snatch you out of my hand. I got you. You'll make it to glory. We saw that through the whole chapter of Romans 8. So what's this? This has caused many throughout church history to throw this doctrine out. It doesn't fit easily in my mind. I don't like it. Your works don't matter. They'll never come into judgment. If they do, I have no hope. And it sounds godly, but it isn't. It sounds good, but what does God's word say? And I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. I'm going to make a statement and defend it. You will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, believer. Not for condemnation, but for confirmation and compensation. So hear that. Not for condemnation, but for the confirmation that you knew Jesus Christ and the compensation of reward for your faithfulness. And so here Paul so emphatic, each one of you, you're going to give an account of yourself. He wants you to think about this and wrestle with this this morning. And so get this, please get this. It's not for your sin. It's not to get your sins judged. What have we learned is, is God said that he, he lo gets on my, do you remember that Greek word? He, he took every sin that you ever committed or will commit and he logizomite it to Jesus, and Jesus is put up on a cross, and now he's guilty for every sin that you ever committed, and he bore the full wrath of God that you deserve to pay for all of eternity in hell. He took the whole cup, and he emptied every last drop. Gone. It, it, yours, it, it said in Romans 4, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not logizomai to his account. The most blessed person in this room this morning is that your sins will never be put to your account. Does that make you smile? Or are you frowning? <laughs> that your sins will never be put to your account now because they were put on Jesus. I'm going to come before judgment and I can never be condemned for one sin because he was in my place. That's unbelievable. So your works don't save you, they confirm you. They confirm that you've been saved. Works are not the ground of your salvation, they're the fruit of it. Fruit does not make a tree good, but a good tree produces good fruit. And Jesus says you'll know them by their fruit. You'll see it. So how do I get into the book of life? That's the one that I, I need to get into. How do I get into that? By faith in Jesus Christ alone in his work and what he's done. There's no other way to get into that book. How do I know if I'm written in the Lamb's book of life? Because he brought me to faith in Jesus Christ. That's how I know that you could spend your whole life looking through that book for your name and it'll do nothing. If you look at Jesus Christ this morning alone for your salvation, you're in the book of life. Yes. Amen. Then your books are going to come out. Let me have... Oh, Andrew Sorderberg's here. Give me Andrew Sorderberg's book of, of, of his books. Let's look at them. 
And they're open and they're not to say, this is his condemnation. Let's look at all his books and condemn him. But it's going to open them up and it's going to be confirmation that Andrew knew Jesus Christ. And I've sat with him and heard the work of Jesus Christ. And his, his testimony is, I'm not what I should be, could be, or ought to be. But because of Christ, I'm not the same. And these books are going to confirm that Jesus Christ has come into his life. And one degree of glory, uh, it just keeps changing him. That's what these books are going to show. There's that old saying, if you were ever on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And I stand here this morning saying, there better be. There better be. And this is not, man, I hope in those books I got more good works than bad works. That's heresy. Don't go there. I, I think, let's just look at the thief on the cross. I bet his book had one thing in it. There's one thing and that authenticated that he knew Jesus Christ. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. I think of my dad, 86 years of living and lies about works, righteousness, and he sees this gospel and he's undone. And for the little months that he had left were the most glorious things that when you opened those books, you're like, this man knew Jesus Christ, he was so radically changed and different. I need the, the books to show the reality of a change, not the quantity. So I don't want you getting lost in that thought this morning. I want you saying that there needs to be some reality in my books of what God has done in my life. Paul has been laboring at the beginning of this book, and it's the last thing he's going to close out with. I'm writing for the obedience of faith. I'm writing so that this gospel, um, you believe it, you're saved, and you live into the righteousness that I am working and in, in, have uh, even de declared before the foundation of the world for your good works that you should walk in them. They're to authenticate you. Whew. Are you with me? I cannot make enough of justification by faith in Christ alone. I can't make enough about how you're to live your life now until you die to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice to love God and love others. Do you see why Paul said, wake up and know what time it is? He said, put off the deeds of darkness that show you didn't know Christ and put on the Lord Jesus Christ that will bear fruit, that will show that you know him. I'm just convinced that we're happy to be apathetic with sins that we've just grown comfortable with. I guess I'm calling us as a church to look at the gospel of Jesus Christ and to get so serious about walking in righteousness and loving God and loving others. I talked to a man this week who was battling with a sin and he said, God just gave me victory. And the way he did it, he says he started waking me up at three in the morning. And instead of going back to sleep, I just got up and started reading and praying and seeking his face. And I started throwing away all the other junk that I used to fill my mind with. And all of a sudden, these sins are just falling off. I just think we get content. And this passage says to me, wake up. Quit sitting on our little keisters. R.C. Sproul said, every day goes to eternity. Everything I do today goes with me to eternity. But your life in Christ will be accounted for. What have you done with the Romans 12.1? Therefore, I urge you by the mercies of God in Christ Jesus. What have you done with that mercy? Sit on the rooftop in your pajamas waiting for Jesus to come back? What have you done with it? Have you grown to love and to serve and, and your conscience, the way we care about each other and where everything we decide is for his glory? What are you doing with the gospel? <laughs> what have you done, my friend? So I want you to hear this loud and clear. This, this hit me all week. It's not too late. Amen. You can stand before God and say, Pastor Murphy preached on Romans 14, and the Holy Spirit did a work on me. 
It's the deepest conviction I think I've ever felt, and I repented of the weak sauce offering that I was giving to God, calling it Christianity. I just fell on my face and repented. And from that day forth, there's there's been evidence that's beginning to, to grow up as I put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm growing and loving God and loving other people. A change like the thief on the cross, and your books are going to be open, and they're going to be like, what's what's the date today? I don't even know. It's July. That July, whatever the date is, that from right there, man, is there a change the way it should be that you know the Lord Jesus Christ. And that change can come through one who believes the gospel and lives into this amazing reality and abides in Jesus Christ can have this. We have the Holy Spirit within us. We have the Word of God. We have it written in our heart. We've been given a conscience to make us holy for the obedience of faith. So don't walk out of here. I'm begging you and say, I got to go work so I can get through judgment. Stop. That isn't what he's saying. Don't go fall on that. That's the razor's edge over here. You're going to fall off. I got to go work harder. I got a judgment day I got to get through. No, I have to go work because Jesus did all the work to save me. He did the hard lifting at Calvary's tree. He saved me. I am compelled now to love him and love others. I'm constrained to love people on these conscience issues. And so this is bigger than who's right or wrong with wine or meat or a Sabbath. I pray that you see this this morning. Don't judge your brother on these issues or condemn. Look down. You'll be judged by whether you showed him mercy or not as one who has been shown mercy. Do you think Paul's serious about this? I just don't know how to make it more serious. James 2, for judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. In my journey, the people who get the clearest doctrine are sometimes the, the, the nastiest. <laughs> they get mean. And I just, I'm trying to rip that rug out this morning that truth makes you be the most merciful person on the face of the earth. There's a book in heaven for how you measured out mercy to others. And that's been Romans 12 through 14. We just keep looking at it. And it's people who go show mercy to other people in love. So I'm going to try it one last time because it, it's tricky. It's razor's edge. These books of all your life will save nobody. They will just show if your life is manifesting the forgiving grace of God in Jesus Christ. Are you showing others that you've received the free grace of God? One preacher said, let us show brotherly affection to one another and not just judgment on everyone and everything. And you know what it looks like when you're gnarly Charlie and you just... All you do is sit around talking to your wife. I can't believe how bad everybody is. And and that's just your life. So there's a day, an appointed day. You're going to stand before God and these books are going to be opened. And they're going to be penetrating. They're going to be holistic. They're going to be retentive. God forgets nothing. And they're going to be perfect. And it will not be looking at my Uh, works to see if I merited eternal life, not my works so I can stand righteous before him, but my works are opened up and they will manifest the reality of the free grace that God has given to me. So you are not saved by your works, but you're saved for them. You're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared before the foundation of the world that we should walk in them. Works manifest our faith, our trust, our love, and our commitment to him. And you're going to appear, and you will have an accounting question. What what did you do with the grace of God that was given to you? And you're not going to answer a word. And maybe you've talked your way out of everything your whole life. You won't answer a word. Your life will be the only evidence necessary as you stand before this God to authenticate that you had saving faith. 
1 Corinthians 3, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder. So here's Paul. I laid a foundation and another is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon these foundations of the gospel and truth. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You better not change that foundation. And churches are doing it all the time. And if any builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each man's work will become evident for the the day, that's the day we're talking about, will show it. Because it's to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work, his ministries, and what he, it's going to get purified by fire. And if any man's work which has been built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. So he, he's still saved, but his, his works were dross. And, and so you see this difference here. And I'm going to kind of bring that out right now and close. Paul, why, why are you bringing this up? Doesn't it feel lofty and almost scary? He wants us to slow down from running around, judging everyone and looking down on each other and not receiving one another with these conscience issues of Christian liberty. Make sure you understand that Christian liberties. Stop. And he says, think more about your judgment day. You're going to give an account for all your Christian liberties that you've, you've prayed over and you, we saw that you do it for the glory of God. You do it for Christ. And you're going to give an account. I, I don't have to worry about it. You're, you're going to give that account to God. How you treated the body of Christ and the unity of the Spirit, you're going to give an account. How you loved your wife or husband, how you led your home, how you served others, how you prayed and labored for souls to be saved. What did we do with the salvation that God gave to us? Grace is not sinful or slothful. Your life will show, though never perfect, one who is not what he should be, could be or ought to be, but because of Christ, you're not the same. That's what's going to happen when they open up these books. And one other thing is it's, it's confirming, but it's also a compensating day In Revelation, Christ says, He's coming quickly and my reward is with me to render to each man according to what he has done. 2 Corinthians 5.10, they'll be recompensed for their deeds. And so this is a tricky one. Uh, Your enjoyment of eternity is determined by how you lived here on earth. So here's this razor's edge again in in Luke 12. He says that someone are going to get hotter hells, the one who they knew the truth and they didn't do it versus, you know... um, Sodom and Gomorrah, who didn't know the truth. And he's saying it's going to be worse for you in judgment because you you knew the truth. And so that there's degrees of suffering in hell and there's degrees of, of, of understanding this reward and fullness in glory. And so what I want to make sure you don't fall off the edge is we're all going to be perfectly perfect in heaven. You're going to have no more sin. You're going to see Jesus's face. You're going to be perfectly happy and joyful for all of eternity. Will behold his glory. But there's a distinction to what degree of how we're going to enjoy heaven, God, based on our lives. And we're about out of time, so just write down Luke 19, 11 through 29. And that's the, 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 um, the, the parable with, with uh, the minas and, and rewards and different things. I'll just have you go read that on your own because I've gone way over. So this is, this is tricky. There's going to be judgment for those who, who knew what was right and didn't do it, and the reward is going to have degrees and differences and distinction. And I've used that illustration. Some of you are new, so you haven't heard it, but I'm going to use it again. I, I got it from a different preacher. And he said, I want you to picture three guys going to, to hear a choir, an orchestra, and it's, all they're going to play is Bach. And the first guy going, he just has a little bit of interest in that kind of music. The second guy uh, studied it in college, and, and he became a master of, of Bach. And then the third one is, is a composer <coughs> who just knows every nuance and beauty of a choir orchestra when, the, when they're playing. And so you can tell I'm out of my league. I don't even know who Bach is. Um, so as they sit there, they're all going to enjoy the concert. I don't know if I would, but... <laughs> 
they're just going to be taking it in and they're going to get done and go, wasn't that great? And the first one enjoyed it. And the second one enjoyed it to a different level because they, they could understand and perceive things. And the third one enjoyed it to the best because he just, every change of tune and note, he's just like, yes, yes. And so there's, there's these different degrees of enjoyment. And, and God is saying, we're going to have that. There's going to be a compensation uh, as we enter in to glory. So the believer, your works will show that you put your faith in the Son of God, your books. And the unbeliever, no matter what you mentally assented to, how convinced you were that you were going to heaven, your life will prove that you really did not know him. And my joy as a pastor is as I meet, I'm just watching God change you from one degree of glory to the next. And I don't want you to fall off the cliff. I'm not perfect. All I know is there's no hope for me. And I want you to see that there is. And I'm watching God change and transform you by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as we close out, get more concerned about this than judging everyone else on conscience issues. Some of you, I, I think you have more joy uh, judging people on conscience issues than eating pizza. It's just like, I love this. And I, I just want you to quit loving it. I want you to be set free. Paul's telling me here that judgment will be more concerned about how we love one another on these issues than whose standard was more holy. And I just want to bring, I just want to bring a life to God that commends the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that what you want? I just want to bring to God a life that commends such a beautiful gospel that to live worthy of the calling that you've received. And as I close out, I just need to bring one last thought is that this, this judgment day is going to be final. And Jesus is going to either say, depart, ye cursed ones, into the lake that burns with fire forever. Or he's going to say, enter into the joy of your master. Well done, good and faithful servant. There's, there's only two places that you can be sent. And the joy of my heart is that heaven is forever. Like if I just keep persevering, loving Jesus, it's forever. And the, the grief of my heart is if he says away from me, I never knew you, it's forever. And this false teaching that it'll stop after a hundred years or annihilationism, it's just a lie. It will be forever. And the judge will never reverse the sentence. Feel that if you're sitting here this morning and you are not a Christian. I want you to come to Jesus Christ before your judgment. So this morning, what's being offered to you is there's a Jesus, he came into the world and he went up on a cross, sins were being put upon him and God just pours out his wrath and punishes him for every sin that you did so that now God could show you mercy and forgive all your sins and not violate his holy character that's just. He pierced his son through so he could, he could release you. And he's saying, come, come to me and this whole record of every sin that you've ever done, uh, it'll be gone. It'll be, I'll separate it as far as the east is from the west. I'll remember your sins no more. And you're going to come before God in judgment. And you're like, what about all my sins? What sins? <laughs> They're thrown behind my back. I buried them in the sea. They're gone. They will not be logizomide to your account. That's what God's offering to you. But if you come and stand before him in your whole life, you've made up lies and you keep deceiving yourself. It's my parents' fault. You just got all your reasons and you're going to come before the all-knowing eye of Christ. And that's over. And he knows why you did what you did. He knows your motives. You will not be able to lie. You will not be able to talk your way out of it. Just you and your life before the Holy One, Jesus Christ. Please do not come to Christ uh, don't come to Christ before judgment day. Please, come this morning if you've never come. And you will now appear before him and hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And when you come, he will begin changing you so that you're going to have books that will be opened up and will show that the power of God has entered into your life. Amen? Amen. To God be the glory. All that for should I eat meat or not? I love the Bible.
Just love it. Father, thank you for this beautiful answer. But God, I've been sobered. I pray that we all wake up, know what time it is, be done with the deeds of the darkness and put on the armor of light. God, let us put on the Lord Jesus Christ in all his fullness and all his beauty. And God, from being made one in union with Jesus Christ, I pray, let us live by faith that produces the fruits of the Spirit. God, let us be people who trust and love and look to you for all things and your purposes and your kingdom and your glory and help us to quit building our little kingdoms and making our little issues mountains instead of molehills. God, help us to love one another with difference. Please, God, for this puts you on display and that the way we treat one another is going to be in those books that will be opened up. And you are very concerned about how we receive one another and the differences on these liberty issues. God, let us be a people that put this on display so that many will say, what is the hope within you? God, do mighty things in every heart here this morning. If any need Jesus Christ, Lord, let them come right now by faith. God, let them not look to their hands to go clean up and change their life. Let them just sit there in brokenness and look at Jesus and believe and the work that he did on that cross and that he lived the life they should have and you will put that to their account that this morning they could sit clean, purified, and just before you. God, let them call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, even this morning. Let them call, open eyes, unstop ears, change hearts. Let salvation reign. Let, let those who have just 30 years of fake lives, just fake, just mean, nasty, gnarly, nothing, let them this morning live before you through Jesus Christ. And God, let every one of us have books that authenticate that we knew the Lord Jesus Christ. And every one of us wish those books were infinitely more full. We, we, we hate that they're not. But God, we love that there's something in those books because of your grace. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen.